lot of interesting <coughs> questions that I was being teased about during the break, kind of little bits of questions that I don't know about you. Um, Same. Okay. Anyone to come to mind, or well, should we just open it up? Open it up, and they said okay. they'd ask before we ask. Okay, right. Um, now, there was someone I said, stand up and yell a question. It was about psychedelic practice. Where are you? He went away. Okay. Um, I wanted to ask the practice, in your experience and people's experiences in the room, how does, how can using psychedelics be, how can psychedelics be used as a practice, as an ongoing process okay. of spiritual magic? So the question is, how can psychedelics be a practice? Um, I think in the same frame as we might say meditation is a practice. Is it a spiritual maturation? Well, okay, so the value would be towards spiritual maturation. I mean, that was the end of his question. Right, right. So as a practice for spiritual maturation, and his question was also addressed to the room. Um, so let me do my instant research system, which is, uh, how many of you would say that you have over the years, use psychedelics as a practice of spiritual maturation. Are you saying that like, in and of itself? I don't know what I'm saying. That's why I repeat other people's yeah. words when we get to these ones where I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but what I'm hearing is... <laughs> Maybe part of that question is... Uh, implying that maybe two different types uh, of psychedelic use, especially in related to Buddhism, I think we could look at is an initial opening, like you have a, um, you have a, uh, an insight into non-separation, for example, and then you take up like a meditation practice or some way that you can do it without that because um, kind of like Jim was saying, you you take the helicopter to the top of the mountain, you see what's possible. You see um, things really aren't the way they seem, and then you come back to the bottom, and then you say, now let's let's work on the climb. Um, you know, with with these traditional practices of meditation and and so on, versus um, you have the initial insight, and then you just try to repeat the initial insight. Merely with psychedelics. Is that maybe part of the implication of your question? Uh, could be, yeah. Um, also, if anyone has had the experience of using psychedelics in a more methodical way mm -hmm. to share, like how they kept themselves honest. <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah. If you, yeah, if psychedelics as a spiritual path in and of itself, with no other meditation or anything. Um, if anyone has taken that up as their like their primary spiritual practice, um, how's it going? Right. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, I, I need to ask this question because it fits so well to everything that has been said in the first part as well, which is I think the keyword that you just used is see. So you go by a helicopter and you see something, and every time you take the drug, you experience something that's mostly not boring. You experience something, you talk about it with your friends, it was good or bad or horrific, whatever. But you, you have something that you that you grasp with your conscious mind. But you mentioned Dogen, and if I understand him right, you are stuck in the moment when you think that something that you can grasp with your conscious mind is anything important. <coughs> I think, in my opinion, you can basically, I don't want to say you can only you lose, but it is a problem if you think that by searching for an insight, for a spiritual path in the external, by taking a substance or, you know, accumulating experience, I don't know, you know? Yeah, so this, the question is, um, with, a, with an initial experience, you um, see a certain realm of reality or something, but you see it at, just that very language implies that there may be a subtle uh, duality there that you're seeing something, and it might be very, very subtle, but the emphasis is on seeing 
a realm. Um, and this is true that it, that uh, in in my tradition of Soto Zen, Dogen Zenji um, criticized this word Kensho, which in Rinzai Zen Kensho means seeing the nature of reality, seeing nature, seeing Buddha nature. And uh, it's like the goal, in a way, of Rinzai Zen, one of them, is seeing your nature. And Dogen, in his subtly non do way, was critical of that term for the very reason you're talking about, that it's kind of putting something out there. And he, Dogen's always talking about manifestation or becoming. Um, so you might say, it's not a matter of seeing your true nature, it's about becoming that and manifesting your true nature, which you might not even realize is happening as some objective thing. Uh, and that may be possible with psychedelic use that you're, it's less about seeing and more like you realize that you are manifesting and then um, it's less that you want to see something again but you want to manifest again, which is also this issue of repeating something again. Uh, did that address it, question some? So the one, maybe one, one short comment on this, um, it's, it's maybe very well explained in a, th in a book, I think, by Koto Sawaki, when he said, um, all this talk about enlightenment, you know, it's, um, it's as if someone would fall asleep and then uh, claim, like scream out, oh, I'm asleep. You know, it's not going to happen. <laughs> 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 just asleep without Okay. Yeah, it's easy to make enlightenment into something and then try to get it. Right. I mean, it's not a thing. It's not a destination. It's not a realization that colors the rest of your life. It's not a sense of awareness that pervades more and more of your life. See, the wonderful notion is um, there's a, there was a, a, many, many years ago, there was a wonderful commentary in a Quaker magazine. This was after the Panky uh, study. And it made a wonderful case for that only someone who had done a lot of spiritual work and a lot of preparation and had uh, kind of obeyed the precepts should have these experiences once they use psychedelics. And that fit, therefore, into the normal model that this was an accelerator in the direction you were already going and that it was best in the prepared mind. And then he said, of course, maybe God is actually not limited by that. It may be that I'm just making this all up because that's what a good Quaker would say. And maybe people can actually become spiritually developed totally without any of the things that I know are necessary. I like that article. Because it really said, these substances are not easily put into the pigeonholes of spiritual development, of psychological <coughs> development, and of course the question of uses. I mean, if you kind of look at the meditation uses, they're very few. No one says, hey, should we go meditate tonight? But they do say, hey, you want to drop tonight? <laughs> Meaning, do you want to use psychedelics in a totally trivial recreational way? <laughs> and the answer is, yeah, that sounds pretty good. <laughs> or, I'm a person who's developing a product which will become a company and maybe have a, be named after a fruit. Psychedelics might orient me in a very interesting way for my life. <laughs> and there's another use, uh, which is I wish to understand my, my uh, alcoholism, my neurosis, my uh, obsessiveness, my uh, inability to have relationships, um, my inability to control my weight. I've been told that a psychedelic at a given dose with someone helping me could, could work with that. Or if I have post-traumatic stress disorder, that there's another substance, not exactly psychedelic, MDMA, 
which looks like it can do more more quickly than 30 years of therapy and medications. And the data on that's you know terribly good. And there's another use of psychedelics, which is what we're pretty much focusing on this evening, is to pass beyond, is to go into a word that comes out of, of my background, transpersonal, which is through and beyond the personality. Where the realization that one returns with from the glimpse or the seeing is that the personality is not the largest box <coughs> of your identity. That it's actually a subsystem. And therefore, its turmoils are not all that exciting. And probably the, the best manifestation of that, the kind of most successful spiritual neurotic in our culture, is Ram Dass. <laughs> Which is, if you really listen to Ram Dass, he's saying, I'm actually just as neurotic as ever, but it really doesn't bother me. <laughs> that's a kind of development that I think is one of the questions we're looking at when we're seeing what's the purpose of psychedelics, not as necessary as spiritual practice and methodical, I think, probably frighten most of the serious drug users in the room here. But when it is appropriate might be a better a better way of looking at it. When is it when is the correct time in one's life to do such and such? Um, and that's I guess a question that I would think would occur uh, within Buddhist practice as well. Um, since most of the time, as far as I know, the most serious meditators I know are not meditating. And the most serious drug users I know are not taking drugs. So there is, again, something about timing and something about a correctness um, that is very hard to necessarily determine from outside. One of the things that is, I think, lacking in the psychedelic world is the, the equivalent of people who are seriously devoted and are in the position of helping others, such as within the Zen tradition, that you have devoted your life not to work on yourself, <coughs> but to being of working on yourself in the service of others. On the whole, most people who take psychedelics don't say that. They will go through half of that. <coughs> I'm working on myself and I want to make the world a better place. But there's still a lot of self, which I think is where the, the original question arose, which is, and that may be a difference. Uh, also, just thinking in another, maybe this is another angle here, but um, the, uh, the function of both of these, uh, what can we call them? The traditions, disciplines, they're not quite, what's a word that we can use for psychedelic practice, practices? Yeah. Awakening technologies. Awakening technologies. <laughs> is there a negative term? Experience. What? A hybrid shamanic experience. Hybrid shamanic experience. Hybrid. Hybrid. Oh, that's nice. Hybrid that's shamanic that's experience. That's <coughs> I like that. Who's is that? Yes. Okay. Oh well. Good for Ralph. <laughs> Another thing that they, they both do with um, I think it was Myron Stolaroff said something like that the main thing that he's seen is that they dissolve um, mindsets. Um, so any kind of fixed mindsets, um, cultural and societal uh, um, assumptions that we, a lot of things that we like just take for granted, um, one sees through, through, through both of these technologies. Um, and that's partly, some people maybe would theorize, that's why some of these things are illegal because they, um, they threaten the very like, fabric of society. Um, and also, I think there were times in the Buddhist tradition where it was seen that um, Buddhist practice was a threat to society because it kind of like undermined the kind of status quo and the, the way things are, are, uh, are set up. Like the Buddha was kind of like dropped out of society, right? I tr came up with this whole other way of living that nobody could really stop him. 
and uh, from certain points of view, that's dangerous to society. Uh, so it's just another thing that occurs to me. Um, one of the people I've worked with over the years, a woman named Kathy Spieth, uh, had a wonderful <coughs> sentence, which is, enlightenment is always a crime. <laughs> and by that, what she was saying is that culture wants to remain stable and wants, in a sense, its institutions to be supported and believed in. And that enlightenment from any tradition cuts through that. And so what she was pointing out is from a cultural <coughs> standpoint, it's in a sense culturally correct to define enlightenment as a crime. And when you have, um, if, if, you, if you play it right and you say, well, we don't really get enlightened <coughs> down until after a really long time, don't bother us. <laughs> and in the 60s, we didn't understand that. We said, well, we'll get enlightened over the weekend. We'll be back to you. <laughs> oh, we came back to you, and we don't like any of your institutions. <laughs> no, we don't like war anymore. Yeah. No, because killing people is like taking a hammer to your thumb. <laughs> and we've been looking at education, too. <laughs> and don't even bring up banks. <laughs> and what we found, at least in the 60s, is everyone reacted as we now would expect, which is, you're attacking what makes my life work. I don't like whatever it is you're doing. And you say, well, they're plants. You say, well, I'll make plants <laughs> illegal. At which point there's this snicker in the plant world. <laughs> and the psilocybin mushrooms say, we're going to grow everywhere. <laughs> and my image of, of psilocybin mushrooms is I was in the Vancouver airport once. And, I'm, and you're, when you're up in the area where you can see the runways. And between the runways, you know, there's, there's grass usually. I mean, little green things and little sprouts. Not what Santa Cruz says grass is. And all of a sudden, a old VW bus roars into the space between the runways. <laughs> kind of like a clown car. Six people jump out. <laughs> they run around with little baskets. <laughs> and in about five minutes, they then jump back into the VW and, and flee. Because <laughs> it turns out that psilocybin mushrooms of one genus or another happen to grow very well on that strip. <laughs> so one of the things that's happening in terms of the cultural issues, is there really is this shift into agendas that are quite different from the 60s. And they are agendas generally agreed upon that are proposed by the plants. And that's quite different. That uh, ayahuasca and San Pedro, um, Abigail, um, Happen, seem to be often talked about as teachers. Um, lots of people talk to me about mama ayahuasca and about grandfather plants. Nobody ever says um, mama LSD because there was something different. And so one of the one of the distinctions is to what extent the psychedelics are not necessarily <coughs> a methodical practice, but to what extent they are developing an agenda that is quite different from the agenda of personal or even societal transformation. And that's really a question that is coming up. Um, I mention this because I'm going to be at a spirit plant medicine conference um, next week. And what I've noticed is most people are very, very attached to their plant. <laughs> the way one is attached to one's lineage or one's guru. Um, versus some of my um, kind of biochemically hip friends who, if it says to see anything, I'm going to try it. <laughs> Which is a very different orientation. And I'm just saying we're beginning to see some differentiation that we've never really seen before. And since 
it does seem to happen that people are attracted to many serious disciplines and practices after these psychedelics. Um, I'm just wondering whether Buddhism is going to now have to deal with... Um, in the 60s, it was pretty clear that for many Buddhist teachers uh, what happened. I'm not sure what's happening now with, with a whole set of very, very different sets of experiences and whether they're still being then attracted uh, to more methodical and gradual practices. Um, another thought that comes to mind is shifting again a little bit is uh, just wanting to honor the people who've uh, spoken from to kind of play the devil's advocate a little bit because part of Buddhist tradition is is being open to all the points of view and so we might not have anybody in this category in this room because they did, weren't interested in such a discussion but there have been people via Facebook and so on um, <coughs> who seem to imply that um, that uh, they never had, that they used psychedelics maybe quite a bit, and that they never had these positive, transformative, um, insightful experiences. Or if they did, they've, they've blocked them out at some point or something. So I want to uh, um, honor that that may be the case for people that they're used in it. Their effects are um, like, for example, uh, one person said just watching cartoons in the mind. Then maybe that's all there is to it. And um, that may be the case, and if so, then we could ask, well, if one is go venturing into this um, kind of experiment, how can it be a positive, transformational thing? And uh, it may be partly chance, but it also may have to do a lot with um, set, mindset, which in, in Buddhist terms we would say intention, let's say intention, and setting. Um, which is the, all the circumstances. He was, even in the 60s, those were the main factors. It, it doesn't necessarily have to do with just what kind of drug and what size dose, but set and setting very much determine the experience. And I think, Jim, in your book, you talk a lot about what makes it more likely to have a, a positive right. experience. Yeah, in the, in the hard psychedelic uh, side of groups, I'm, I'm this right wing, and it's kind of fun to be right wing in something. But my right wingness is that guides are better than not guides. And that's a, a, I'm, I'm more and more clear that I find that um, a useful distinction, uh, which is the purpose of a guide is not to direct you, but when you need help to assist you. And it's a little bit as if you were in you know, in the uh, in Africa on a safari, uh, the guide takes you to a place where you're likely to see animals. And he may say something like, you see that rhinoceros coming toward us? You do whatever you want, but I would recommend standing behind this tree. <laughs> and you think, why? The rhinoceros I know has very poor vision. <laughs> and that's where guides are helpful. <laughs> they also allow you to go to places you wouldn't go on your own. And in the 60s, we talked a lot about set and setting or intention and kind of ambiance. And we now also add to that what's the substance, and what's the dosage, what is the, the sitter or the guide, and also what is the post situation. Which is the question is, integration, uh, particularly when I talk to the people who have done their important work, say, in Peru with ayahuasca, and then they're back here, or they're back in Cincinnati. Um, and integration becomes very critical. And I'm thinking of a, of a friend um, who, whose life was not working at all. And now and then he would basically... Um, drink alcohol to unconsciousness. He did not drink alcohol. It was social, it was not fun, it was not friendly, it was, it was a way to get as close to oblivion as possible. And I knew he used psychedelics. And I felt, you know, kind of personally, you know, I, that was not good. And I said, what happened when you take psychedelics? He said, I had wonderful experiences. They were so happy and so blissful, I thought. 
What happened? He said, when I'd come down, the world was as bad as ever. And I thought, gee, when I'd come down, the world's better than ever. And that's a, that's a, bridge, that's a gap that we couldn't cut across. So that the, the problem for me is that the words, we're not careful enough. Which is, I, don't, I try not to talk about psychedelics. I try not to talk about drugs. I try to talk about psychedelic experiences. Because that distinguishes, that takes in set and setting and dosage and sitter and situation. Um, and that seems to me what's critical. Um, just as you're pointing out that within meditation we have many of those same issues. Guide. Right? Mm -hmm. right. Set and setting, mm -hmm. all of it. So here we are. So let's have another question. My question is this. Yes. Um, what you've been skirting around, it seems to me, is the idea of um, a ritual based on ingestion of psychedelics. A very structured ritual with a leader sure. in, the set, in the setting and then the integration afterwards. But mm -hmm. we haven't really talked about that. Okay. So maybe what, my other question is um, maybe we would talk a little bit about. Well, let's, 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 okay. that's a good enough question. The this, this question is, what about, that we have we been skirting around the notion of psychedelics within a structure, uh, with a ritual, and, and all of the attendant things? Well, again, if we look at what's happening, uh, we now have uh, several churches, which have won an enormous hassling. Uh, with the federal government, which have as a central sacrament psychedelic ayahuasca, uh, and they have very firm rituals, which you, if you go to their services, that's it. That's the way it is, and it's as firm a ritual as if you were going to high Episcopal church. And that is a model that is um, found to be mentally healthy, meaning people have researched members of the daimi or the vegetal versus a matched population in the same um, area in South America. And it's a, it's a healthier, it, you're healthier and smarter and saner and less likely to be an alcoholic and diabetic, etc. if you're in the daimi. The question is what's the use of psychedelics? And it may be to be healthier and smarter and have less diabetes. Uh, it may be other things. So again, I think what we're seeing is, is a proliferation of uses. Um, on the other hand, um, a wonderful healer who I met in Santa Cruz said, I only, I was talking set setting and so forth, he said, yeah, I only take LSD at Burning Man. <laughs> and I thought, as some of you just did. <laughs> and he said, that's the only place I feel free enough to have the experience I want. And certainly, again, those of you with Burning Man experience, you, you, know, you all went, hmm. <laughs> so we're, we're at a, a, a place of proliferation of possibilities. Now, I also know a group that has worked with a ritual for 30 years with psychedelics. Um, they're quiet. They're in Marin. They originally uh, began with peyote, and they basically were trying to be just exactly what the Native Americans don't like, which is imitation Native Americans, kind of pretend Native Americans. And then at some point the peyote ran out. And so they thought, well, why don't we just take something else? Okay, which doesn't sound like the Native American tradition. But it sounds like the Marin tradition. And so they basically have changed substances as availabilities. But they've had 30 years of the same group. They meet approximately, they used to meet once a month, they now meet once a quarter. And the thing that interests me is I've met several of the second generation. And these were the kids who said, I remember going to sleep sitting in back of my parents for these all-night events when I was a kid. And now I'm sitting with them and becoming actually a leader. And so what we're seeing is, here we go in generations of ritual. And so uh, the nice thing, from my point of view, is that um, psychedelics appear to have lots of uses. Uh, 
I go around talking about creative problem solving and hard science because that's one of the things that most people don't think is possible. And um, except if you happen to live in Silicon Valley and you know what a lot of companies are based on. But if you look at the theoretical literature, it takes you places, it's very emotional, it's full of bright colors, it's full of non-interest in the material world. Um, how could you use it for developing a, a marketing plan for a new semiconductor? And the answer is, if that's what interests you, that's your intention, that's the set, and that's the setting, and that's the guide, and you're using the right substance at the right dose, that's another use. So we're, we're moving out of the kind of 60s, you take it and you go somewhere and then you stop. And hopefully you don't get in trouble. To a very, very wide range of uses. And the other thing I'm seeing is that, um, that Buddhism is not a kind of esoteric, cool thing that doesn't have much to do with being in the middle of the culture which it certainly was at some point. Who could resist that? To um, add to the uh, <coughs> ritual setting and to bring the, the topic of Buddhism and psychedelics together, I uh, just wanted to mention, you might be surprised, about there's, a, there's an experiment scheduled for next summer um, by a friend of mine, and he, he said, oh, please feel free to mention this to the group. Um, Vanya Palmer's is the uh, senior Dharma heir of Kobanchino Roshi, who was the, a teacher in Santa Cruz many, many years ago. And um, Vanya is a very long-term, very serious Zen practitioner, uh, ordained in Suzuki Roshi lineage. And he lives in Switzerland most of the time, and he got permission from the Swiss government to do this experiment, which is a, uh, we call it Sashin, in Zen, Sashin means to collect the mind, gather the mind, and it's our name for an intensive meditation retreat. Uh, we do it at Santa Cruz Zen Center regularly. Right? So in this case, five day Sashin, you're, you're meditating all day, basically. All silence, you're mostly sitting meditation, interspersed with walking. And um, Vanya is very interested in this, this integration of these realms, so the experiment, um, I, people want to see on the break, I have the, the written um, kind of proposal for the, in kind of scientific language for this. Um, on the fourth day of a session, there will be 20 people who uh, take a medium dose of psilocybin and 20 who don't uh, in a double blind experiment and um, basically see what happens. <laughs> and uh, uh, particularly around the, the, in the mystical experience department, and they're they're doing a lot. They're, he's hand invited, selecting the people, inviting particular long-term meditators. Um, he's doing study uh, interviews with them beforehand about lots of different areas, and then follow up. Particularly, I think this is a, a very important area. Follow up afterwards in this Good Friday experiment that was very similar in the Christian realm. They did six months later, how, you know, how many of these changes lasted, and they admitted six months is not very long. So here they may do six months, maybe longer, to interview last, uh, lasting effects. So um, that's maybe the furthest this has gone in this integration um, of uh, serious, intensive Buddhist meditation integrated with psychedelics. And he said, particularly, medium dose, meaning like, People often have these kind of non-dual experiences with high dose, but without meditation. So the kind of the part of the proposal of the experiment is um, after a lot of, after four days of all day meditation, can the same thing, similar thing happen with a smaller dose? So stay tuned for results. <laughs> I was not going to mention that study. It never. So this is a difference. It never occurred to me it was legal. <laughs> I knew of the study, and I thought, that's so cool. Uh, but I am beginning to also see is the reason things are becoming legal uh, is that there is only one group left who don't have a large percentage of their members with psychedelic experience within the intellectual 
parts of the world. And that's legislators. <laughs> Everyone else seems to have a moderately high percentage. And um, I have a very small ongoing experiment. When you write a book, um, there's an element of personal prostitution that enters into your life, which is you walk around with this book and you sit next to someone on an airplane and they, you know, have their own life, but you, within several minutes, have let them know they have the opportunity <laughs> to be interested in this book about psychedelics. And I have been on enough of those events and I'm sitting next to someone who looks like he used to work for the CIA and now works for Chase or J.P. Morgan and he's on the flight to go sell a small South American country to a large corporation. <laughs> and the first look I get is, if you were a bug, I'd swash you. Wow. And then there's this little thing I watch and the eyes kind of go a little glassy. And the voice changes. And he says, once in college. <laughs> and I know I'm going to sell a book. <laughs> Not that that interests me if I were a Buddhist, <laughs> but since I'm not, I'm really delighted. And I then wait for this wonderful story, and it's usually quite short, like, I remember running down the street in Berkeley at two in the morning, naked, <laughs> yelling, what are you all doing, hiding in your clothes? <laughs> and then the, the glassy eyes shift again. And I'm scum. <laughs> and, you know, kind of we resume our roles. Mm -hmm. But there is that moment, and that's what's actually different between now and the 60s. In the 60s, if you sat next to those people, they had never had anything you've had and they didn't like you for having it. Tim Leary said one, one very profound thing is that LSD is very peculiar as it causes psychotic behavior in people that have not taken it. <laughs> <laughs> but there are less and less of those people left. And that's the remarkable shift. And so the Swiss study has been approved See, this is a very critical study, not because it isn't just incredibly fun and interesting and smartly done, but it's breaking a scientific boundary, which is so much of the research in psychedelics, the, the current, what's called a renaissance, um, is all about medical uses. It's all about repairing damaged people. And they're picking mainly damaged areas where modern medicine is particularly lousy, like post-traumatic stress disorder, cluster headaches, uh, anxiety while dying of cancer. Nobody in the medical profession, nobody likes those people. People with chronic pain, the medical profession doesn't like them because they can't help them. And that's painful for everybody. So the psychedelic people kind of move into those areas and nobody minds. <laughs> But when you cross the boundary between medical and normal into spiritual, you're making a huge cultural shift. Because now the government is in this very interesting position of supporting spiritual development. Now that to me is very interesting. Because we really haven't had that. And if you watch carefully in this country, we're, we, it's kept... Uh, when they do these experiments, say John Hopkins, the one I read you early in the evening, it doesn't get reported in the Journal of Religious Education. It will be reported in the Journal of Psychopharmacology. So it's, it's still dressed like medical science. And even the word double blind. Now, um, I don't know if you've ever been in a double blind study with a psychedelic, but it's a joke. <laughs> After an hour, the room breaks into two groups, the ones that are pissed off that they're the placebo. <laughs> and the other people who couldn't care less who are the people who were pissed off. <laughs> and this was true in the original 
initial study and it came through in early and later studies. And what the scientists do, because it's a real question in the uh, science world, is what can we use as the placebo? Well, the only thing that actually works is a lower dose. But then what happens if the lower dose is enough and the people say get better from whatever the ailment is or have a missile experience, then you don't get clean science. So you have, you have this wonderful problem of do we really do these really stupid double blinds where everybody knows, and every, and which is really hard on the researchers because they're there all day with people supposedly pretending. Because you're not, you know, if you're the researcher, you're supposed to, you know, keep up the facade. Um, or do you basically say, well, I don't know if you're the placebo or not because you're so high. <laughs> so, um, those of you who like to play with science, there's some very fascinating new games coming up. And this particular study is a really important one because it's cutting right across what we're doing tonight. And it's cutting right across some very serious questions. To what extent does a spiritual tradition interact favorably or unfavorably with psychedelic experience? And there is a, a book I recommend to you called The Secret Drugs of Buddhism by Michael Crowley. And the secret dogs of Buddhism is not about contemporary secret zendos, you know, in Boulder or in Aspen. <laughs> it's about very early Vajrayana, which was as far as Michael's research, and he's a Sanskrit scholar and Tibetan scholar, um, seemed to be entirely um, based on central rituals using psychedelics. So that one of the major branches of Buddhism arose from that psychedelic base. Not true at the moment, but it does raise those questions. And another friend of mine who's a Sufi scholar has a whole bunch of articles basically on psychedelics throughout Sufism, which is another one of the places that has an equivalent of the fifth precept, as you know, in Islam, no drinking. Um, Hashish. <laughs> okay, so again, what we're looking at is how, what's the interaction with religious traditions and, in this case, with the early uh, Islam and, and early Buddhism and the, the plant life that was around them. Because it looks like from the psychedelic side, it is hard to find a culture that didn't eventually find out about the psychedelics that grew in their area and come to terms with them in one way or another. And I think we're still doing that. And the largest Amanita muscaria actually I've ever seen grew in back of a swimming pool a couple of blocks from here. <laughs> um, so that Santa Cruz is more than a major exporting um, county um, for marijuana. But it has other products <laughs> that, that are that we know in various religious traditions. So, so there's no simple answers to any of the things we're talking about. The, from my point of view, and I think we're in agreement, it is about set and setting, it is about intention, it is about teachers, and it is about being aware that, that one can make mistakes and that one can take care of oneself. And those are critical, uh, like with anything else. You know, um, I was pulling out from where I stay down here, and I very carefully looked in the correct direction. There were several bicycles, and I was being very careful, and I didn't look the other direction at all because I glanced and there was no car coming and the lane across, and I almost killed a runner. Because <coughs> I did move out, and uh, it was terribly close, because I was, I was sure there wasn't anything there, so I didn't look. He and I talked about it. He's, I said, I'm sorry I almost killed you. He said, it's okay. <laughs> uh, but we both knew that was the case. And so there is a, a fundamental of responsibility that um, I think is why uh, we like each other, among other things, and that we're coming from that same place. And that place is not easy. That place is, there, there are no, you know, there. The, the nice thing about rituals, and uh, the, say the church like the daimi, is they really do tell you how to behave. 
Um, one of the things about most traditions is they tell you how to behave. Now, they base it on what works, maybe. But they essentially preclude a certain amount of, of having to make decisions. Psychedelics haven't yet come to that place very much. And you raise the issue, does it happen? The answer is yes. Uh, Native American church is another with peyote. Um, but on the whole, without, you know, uh, 24 million Americans have taken LSD since it became illegal. That's just LSD. If we throw in ecstasy and so forth and so on, it's big numbers. And if we throw in marijuana, it's about 140 million. And that's the people who said to the government, yes, I've taken an illegal drug. <laughs> Some of us think it's a low number. <laughs> so we're dealing with a large cultural issue, and we're also dealing with a much more interesting issue to me, which is how do you live your life given the culture you're in? Shall we take some questions? Yeah. I have a question about Buddhism. Could you compare something like the Janet state to psychedelic experience? Say that again. She says, um, can you uh, compare the jhanic states to um, psychedelic experience? Um, jhanas are these different levels of concentration <coughs> states, of absorption, um, particularly in, in Theravada Buddhism. Uh, which we could say are like deepening levels of um, withdrawal from the external world, might be one way to put it simply, more and more absorbed in, um, in non-dual uh, concentration. Um, still, uh, these, these jhanic states were taught by the Buddha at, not as enlightenment itself, not as the insight, but actually concentration states to develop a, a, a really stable body and mind to, um, in order for insight to arrive. So that's an interesting point that um, sometimes overlooked. The jhanas aren't the main point, they're like a kind of path. And many traditions don't practice so methodically. But I think just the, the aspect of um, more and more withdrawal from the, from the external sensory world is one of the ways to develop these jhanas, and uh, I think that's often the, the case with psychedelics. Um, I think maybe part of the, maybe part of the setting with psychedelics in terms of like a detail is like eyes open or eyes closed. In this terms of this of Panke's study about um, um, internal unity versus external unity, with eyes Closed is a kind of internal unity experience. Maybe there's a whole maybe internal world going on, um, and one's not really relating to objects. But with eyes open, one is still visually uh, relating to the uh, apparently external world, and there's a um, the, the the unity of self and sensory objects is a kind of experience that can happen in the so-called mystical experience. So John is maybe more related to the inner unity as opposed to the external unity. And um, yeah, I think, I, you know, there's some correlation for sure. Okay. Um, now, let's go uh, real world, time, etc. Uh, it would be really useful if we had a break. And we'll probably run a little later than 9.30 if we do. Is that okay with everybody? Okay.